Welcome to Mental Health Monday. My name is Mick Coyle. Coming up on the program this week. Language is a big barrier. I work with clients who don't speak English. So, uh, and they rarely leave their houses sometimes or, or their flats or their neighborhoods. It must help you to be able to go, well, actually, if we could, if we could get all these things lined up and supportive, that actually, I imagine that makes your job as a psychotherapist a lot easier because then that support network can come around an individual and they don't feel like they're isolated, alone and without a voice because you've not only given them the voice, but you've also surrounded them with the people who need to be there. Now CIAD offers therapy in 24 different languages and new languages are being added every day as as we get more and more therapists, counsellors. And I'll be reminding you how you can make connections with mental health organisations within your community. It's Mental Health Monday. We are the home of the UK's conversation about mental health. Welcome to Mental Health Monday. My name's Mick, and I hope you're well. Thanks for checking out episode 249. And before I tell you a little bit more about what's coming up in this week's episode, I'm going to tell you what's coming up for episode 250. Got a little bit of breaking news for you here on the podcast. So episode 250, a huge landmark for the program, uh, marking more than five years of Mental Health Monday, a weekly podcast. It's been great five years um but we're not stopping now we carry on absolutely and actually a great opportunity for you to be part of episode 250 because we're going to do it in front of a live audience um i'm really looking forward to this it's going to be fantastic there is a mental health summit taking place in liverpool on may the 9th and it is looking at mental health within the workplace Uh, set up by the liverpool city region and the metro mayor steve rotherham it'll look at how we can make sure that people's lives are best set to be successful and happy but at the same time to make sure that businesses can thrive and that uh, employees are happy within a workplace that we're creating the right environment for people to thrive in and out of work. Now, as part of that, I'm going to be interviewing on stage the creator of the TV show, The Responder, starring Martin Freeman. Uh, Tony Schumacher wrote The Responder and um, just so happens I've known Tony for a number of years. He's always a great talker, so it should be a fascinating insight. I'm not going to do any spoilers for The Responder itself, but it focuses on uh, the mental health of a police officer who is a responder and um, how he copes or doesn't cope given the world around him he's also going through therapy as part of the program as well so uh, it reflects on tony's life and real life experiences so we'll explore that on stage on the day now there are links on my twitter feed at mr mick coyle that's on twitter there's also through the liverpool city region combined authority facebook page links there about how you can get involved in the day itself it should be a really fascinating day right across the day i know jake mills a friend of the show he's involved in some of the talks there's a couple of workshops that are ongoing as well and it should be great right on the liverpool waterfront so quite a prestigious occasion episode 250 of mental health monday with myself mick coyle interview and Tony Schumacher up on stage. There are links in the write-up to this podcast about where you can get hold of tickets and find out some more information. Good, eh? Told you I'd have something good for episode 250. Now, episode 249 comes at the start of Mental Health Awareness Week, and it's, uh, again, always looking to find new angles on the program and to maybe look at things from a different point of view, a, a different point of view we haven't thought about, haven't touched on before. Today, we're going to speak to the team from NAFSIAT. Now, NAFSIAT are based in Archway in London, and they are an organisation that provides intercultural therapy for people from various different backgrounds and, incredibly, does it in more than 20 different languages. It's been running for a number of decades now and has got a brilliant track record in supporting people. Uh, We're going to be speaking to Ali Donat, who's one of the psychotherapists there. He's from Turkey, but they've got people who speak languages from right across the globe because, of course, as a global nation that the UK is, there are people who come to this country who have issues with their mental health. And of course, they have to get them sorted out. And we talk about barriers around mental health provision. What bigger barrier if you can't speak the language or you can't communicate how you're feeling because of language difficulties, which is why NAFSIAT's service is absolutely incredible. I've got a link to NAFSIAT's website. That's N-A-F-S-I-Y-A-T, nafsiat.org.uk to find out more information about the work that they do. That's nafsiat.org.uk. There's a link at the bottom of the podcast 
for that too. I started off by talking to Ali about what the service was and how it came about. Well, thank you very much for, for having me on. Mick. This is um, very exciting for me uh, to be talking about Nafsiyat, uh, which is a, a, a project of work that I do that's very close to my heart. Uh, well, Nafsiyat was started in 1983, in the early 80s, by a man named Jafar Karim. And he uh, was a, a medical professional, a doctor, uh, studied in India, and came to work at the NHS. And he saw that uh, ethnic minorities, and, you know, people from different religious beliefs, uh, cultural backgrounds, didn't really have uh, the same access to uh, mental health treatment. Uh, as you know, white, white British people, that provides free psychotherapy to individuals in their own language as much as possible. And the scale of it is really, uh, you can correlate it with, with language, which is fascinating. Uh, Nafsiyat offers uh, 24 different languages, uh, therapy in 24 different languages, and new languages are being added every day as, as we get more and more um, therapists, counselors uh, to come work for us. Currently, there are around 35 therapists that work for Nafsiyat. That includes um, volunteers, trainees, um, full-time and, and part-time counselors. And just to give you a, maybe an idea of uh, the outreach, Nafsiyat has uh, an encatchment area uh, of a number of boroughs around, well, the center is located in Archway. So last year, uh, Nafsiyat saw 365 clients. Each client gets up to 12 sessions of therapy. And then there are other projects at, at Nafsiyat, which, you know, if you want me to talk about that, there, there's training projects, uh, there's uh, other brief uh, interventions that, uh, that Nafsiyat offers. Yeah, so I think, uh, I think that's a good snapshot of, of uh, the, the scale of Nafsiyat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think it's interesting that so many times, Ali, we talk about um, people using language or finding the language to talk about how, how they feel, talk about their mental health. And so many people don't have that language because, because they, they don't, they've not grown up in a culture where, you know, they've been encouraged to talk about their sense of feelings. And actually, what's really interesting with you guys is that there's the extra hurdle that people not only have to find the language, but they have to find the language in another language as well. So with you guys, that makes it so much easier and probably reflects as well the cultural diversities which exist in, in sort of major UK cities, particularly in London, as has been the case for, for a large number of years now. Yes, absolutely. I think... Um... There is great power in, in talking to someone in your own language, uh, I think. Uh, an interesting uh, fact I always come across is um, uh, some of the clients I see at Nafsiyat, um, they have experiences with uh, having therapy uh, through, a, through an interpreter uh, in the UK. And uh, they've, you know, almost all of them uh, have said that that creates some sort of a barrier between them and the therapist, uh, not to mention the fact that there's a third person in the room. Uh, so they may feel like uh, they can't really open up. And then, yes, we come to um, talking about your mental health uh, issues or, or you know, talking about how you feel uh, in that language. I think even, even for um, you know, native speakers, uh, it requires some level of uh, you know, uh, experience to, to talk about feelings and yourself yeah absolutely you don't have to look very far Ali to look at sort of people from different backgrounds um particularly from different parts of the world who've arrived in in the UK and you look at inequality and you look at access mm. to various different services and mm. you even things like you know access to um uh, vaccine uptake and, and various things like that and often you'll find the, the majority sit within the sort of the, the white British population. And then there's the per peripheries of people who, who maybe struggle to access services or um, don't have the connections with those local services within a local community. And either as a symptom of or, of course, whatever, they find themselves in, in much more difficult circumstances in life as well. And, and, and that will, no doubt, have a huge impact on, on their mental health as well. And I think you guys have clearly identified that mm -hmm. with inequality mm -hmm. comes risks to people, comes, you know, 
problems with uh, their long-term mental health as well. And, and that's something that you, you put front and center, but it, it's obviously a, a vital service. Absolutely. Uh, actually, what you've just touched on is, is, a, is a very good point. Um, the inequality in accessing these services. I think on a human level, what I've seen is also, it's very interesting. Um, there's a level of fear uh, in engaging uh, with services because when you're an, uh, an ethnic minority, often immigrants uh, who come to this country, who don't speak the language uh, as comfortably, there's a, uh, you know, accessing services uh, is, is about engaging with authority. Uh, and often, okay, white majority or the government. And there's, I, I see that there's a level of fear around that. Uh, you know, going to doctors, going to, um, you know, whatever government offices. So mental health practitioners become a part of that. Uh, they represent sometimes the government, the majority, uh, you know, these services that uh, people actually have fears around uh, engaging with. Even something so basic as, um, receiving letters. I found that uh, a lot of immigrant populations um, in, in London that I've worked with, they have real uh, fear around opening official letters. That's got to be crucial then in terms of the work you do, that you've got to create a culture of openness, but trust has, has got to be a huge part of that, hasn't it? Mm, absolutely. And, and I think that's where the... Um, intercultural or cultural elements uh, come into play, where you have, uh, I mean, this is a, uh, actually a, a hotly debated issue, how um, sort of Western psychotherapy, uh, it, you know, has a very white male uh, orientation in terms of training, in terms of all the theories. Uh, but then when you're engaging with ethnic minorities, you need to look through a uh, through an intercultural lens so that would mean uh, exactly like you pointed out if i'm uh, engaging with you know most of my clients and and now said i've been turkish uh, clients so when i'm engaging with them uh, it's kind of different so um i might uh, go outside some of the the traditional uh sort of theories uh and and what we've been taught in in training in the west uh, in terms of bringing them into therapy, because every culture, every group of people plays psychotherapists in a different uh, position in their own cultures. So they might perceive you um, as someone, somewhat of a, of a healer or a GP or someone like that, so, um, or a community worker. So if, if uh, the part of the culture requires you to become part of the community and engage with them in a way that they would uh, find it helpful. They would be comfortable coming into to Nafsiat. That that's that's what it's about. I think that's re that's really really interesting because actually it, it strikes me that so often the conversation around mental health, particularly around uh, white middle aged guys, is often uh, culturally uh, from a from a from a UK point of view, it's about perceived um, perceived success in life, and you know whether it's you know are you in a marriage that you know has survived a divorce and with that can obviously become problems do you have a good job do you have a nice house do you earn money can you can you live in this world but it's very much framed around the success of what essentially capitalism um but is it you you must have examples though of people whose whose life world is framed by just other things obviously health and sort of success of various different kinds is, is, is important to so many people, but you must get a sense of, 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 of different types of drivers, different types of worlds and mindsets that various uh, different people bring. Absolutely. And it, that's uh, actually I mean, it's so interesting and exciting to, uh, to do work in, in Nafsia to get in and, and be let into this world. Uh, of, of, of different cultures and different peoples and, and to experience that and to try to understand it. So it, you're absolutely right. With, with different cultures, there are different themes, uh, different drivers. Um, I find that, um, and, and again, we need to be mindful of the fact that uh, the people we see at Nausiat, the clients, they're in the UK, they're, they're taken out of their uh, own hometown uh, or, or home cultures or their second generation, they're here in the UK. That creates an added layer of, of experience, added layer of, uh, of drivers. But I find 
um, things like family, you know, family systems are huge, hugely important. And you might think, you know, great example, if, if you know, you came to a, a therapy session or, or, or someone else or you're talking about their careers and, uh, and, and, and capitalist drivers, as, uh, as you, you put it, whereas for someone in a different culture, family might be uh, in front and center of, of uh, their life and their driving force. Um, you know, things like parenthood, children, uh, sense of community, religion and spirituality uh, are huge. Uh, so, so these are some of the themes that, you know, I'd like to, to be mindful of, to, to understand, uh, you know, there isn't a, a, a single lens or single uh, sort of thing that we can look through to, to understand everyone. You know, you have to be open to uh, to different interpretations, different drivers. Yeah. It, it, let me let me ask you sort of a slightly different version of that same question, then, which is what what is that what uh, that thing that you touched on? You know, family or maybe like community. Are those the the threads? You must get a sense of what those those the the, the th human threads that pass through us all. Maybe a sense that we want to we all want to feel like we're part of something, mm. whatever whatever that thing is for wherever we're from. That we all feel like we're part of something. Maybe. Well, you've touched upon something again. I've experienced very early on at at Nauset. I've been I've been with Nauset for three years, um, and the single most important. Uh, thing that I take away from my work with with Nafsiad is um, yes the, the common ground the common threads uh, that sort of bind us all um, because I often I was so shocked I still am I, I get surprised whenever I start with uh, a new client the uh, the differences the cultural differences uh, that exist even with, uh, with people from my own culture with Turkish people that's been the most astonishing thing you know, uh, you might think, okay, here's a Turkish person, they speak Turkish, well, let's put the two of you in a room. Well, Turkey is a very diverse country. There are many different people from, from different religions, uh, different cultural backgrounds, different languages, and, and to experience that with a simple hello. Uh, you know, even from the way you say, hello, how are you doing, take a seat. All of a sudden, all those differences are in the room. How do you work with that? Uh, sometimes, I mean, I often think, okay, there is no way me and this person, uh, you know, are, are are even on the same in the same world. Sometimes, you know, I might get ideas like that, and then and then I I think it's it's my job uh, to understand them, to uh, to really explore their world with them, and then without. Um, without a doubt, at the end of uh, you know a few sessions or at the end of my uh, their therapy sessions, I always come away thinking, okay, yes, there are those threads. Yeah, you know, w whatever whatever the cultural differences are, whatever the age, status, uh, class, gender, whatever those are, there are those common threads that that bind us, that that really make us human. I like the idea that you know you'd, you'd meet someone they're from Turkey same age mm -hmm. as you male maybe they've, they've got family whatever and then you think well I, I'm probably going to get on with this person and then maybe you get in a room one of you is a Besiktas fan the other supports Galatasaray and then suddenly <laughs> you realize whoa hang on a minute we might we might have a problem um, but, but actually Absolutely. the themes are all there about you know love of football love of supporting your team and and, and all that kind of stuff um Maybe traps on sport. We should be talking about in terms of Turkish <laughs> football as well. That's a that's a different conversation though. Uh, slightly early. Can I ask but, you about the but, intercultural therapy? Can I ask you about this? Because of course, when you've got individuals who are coming in, you know, the twenty four languages to thirty five different people, but for it to be an intercultural therapy, I wonder what the crossover points are. You know, the things that make people feel like um, they're, they're they're part of something when they come through your door. Um, or if you are able to sort of, either through the services that you have, sort of connect people who are from different types of backgrounds so that it's not just a bespoke local service for people from a particular background and everyone's on their own, that it's an intercultural thing, that, 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 that people start to come together through mm -hmm. the work that Nafsiat does. How are different, you know, the, the way I understand that question, the way I think about that question is how are differences uh, then worked out in the room. 
what if there are differences in the room? And this is, again, a, a major topic in, in intercultural therapy. And what uh, Jafar Karim, the founder of Nafsiyat, as he, he is uh, put it beautifully by saying, um, you, you bring the whole person into the therapy room. So, so you look at the whole person, the therapist and uh, the client. So in order to really uh, to work through issues, in order to really understand uh, those differences must be brought into the room to be worked out. And this is, um, I think this is really uh, what separates an intercultural therapist or a therapist that's um, oriented towards intercultural issues from just any other psychotherapist because um, I think uh, I try to, to understand what those differences are. And it requires a lot of training, a lot of um, practice to be able to bring those uh, differences in. You know, what happens if there's a, a, a white therapist and a black client, uh, or a therapist and client from different religions, different cultures? Um, you know, how are those worked through in the room? I think that that's that's very important, and that it really underlines the the inter or, uh, of the uh, of the word intercultural therapy, because it's not to say that uh, as therapists or or Nafsiyat picks and chooses the most suitable client. Okay, yes, there are language and and there are, you know other considerations, but often uh, actually it's. What what you opposite to what you might think you might think you know okay this person would benefit from working through these uh, these cultural issues from somebody who's from a completely different uh, or or an, or an opposite uh, culture. I think that's really I think that's really interesting. It, it it just goes to show that the sort of um, the 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 balancing that you have to do when when people come to your door because it's not mm -hmm. just about going well we need a turkish speaker so here's a turkish yeah. psychotherapist it's about well what are the issues who's the right person to speak to and language language i guess is is a barrier you've got to overcome but then you're dealing with the person you know and mm -hmm. and, and 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 the conversations that, that need to come can i ask you this in terms of the the sort of issues that you're dealing with uh for people from various different backgrounds though i i'm sure there will be people who have issues the same as someone a, a native uk uh, an English speaker might have what well, might be the same as, as people who are Im uh, immigrants, maybe, or, or don't speak English as a as a first language. But are there issues that you have to deal with through Nafsia that are specific to the fact that people are maybe coming from a different country, that they may have experienced difficult things, that they may have had difficult journeys to get here, and of course, when they do get here, that culturally things are are different. Yes, absolutely, and. Um, I think I'll give you a little bit of uh, background on how we um, sort of intake clients. Uh, they go through what we call an assessment uh, session, one or two sessions with a, with a psychotherapist where they, uh, it's not uh, a, a traditional psychotherapy session. It's more about um, getting facts and, and their background and, and what are you know, some of the issues that they want to work on in therapy. And there it's really, uh, we're looking at uh, a number of things like, uh, like what you said that would be important for, a, um, for therapy, but also for addressing uh, some of the recurring themes, recurring uh, problems or issues that we see with uh, you know, either minorities or, or immigrants in this country. Uh, absolutely uh, issues around uh, or, or information that's about where they're from, uh, their hometown, their, their home uh, uh, culture, uh, but also how they got here. Were they uh, refugees uh, or were they, um, did they go through any hardship coming here? Were they illegal immigrants? Were they legal immigrants? Uh, you know, uh, what, what did the UK uh, take uh, and, and what did it require? Um, and what sort of a, uh, an experience was that? Um, and then, things around their living conditions here. Uh, you know, are they, um, do they have needs around, uh, you know, accessing social services? Again, what we were talking about, how uh, maybe sometimes minorities or, or immigrants have difficulties accessing some of, uh, you know, government services. Now, SIAP will 
then put them in touch with you know social services or 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 whoever um, would be best uh, positioned to help them in in other areas. Um, things like accessing benefits, housing. What what is their uh, what are the, the living situation like? Uh, or uh, again, I, I think I talked about told you about uh, childcare, um, mobility, disability issues. Uh, those are some of the again uh, we're looking for um, issues around accessing uh, you know care and government assistance and and things of that nature and coming to therapy. Again, as I've said, um, language is a big barrier. I've worked with clients who don't speak English. So, uh, and they rarely leave their houses sometimes or, or their flats or their neighborhoods. How will they come to Nafsia to see you face-to-face? Uh, -face? So again, these are not issues that you might readily uh, sort of think about when you're, when you're um, you know, engaging with, with a native speaker uh, or or a or a you know white British person, for example, but these are some of the issues that you need to be mindful of. No, absolutely. I think I think that's huge as well because you might look at a person who's got problems. They might be identified as as, as needing support, but language is a problem. Understanding of where they they're from and what they've been through is a, a, a problem. They then don't have either the trust or the ability to communicate, and yet. An organization like Nafsiak comes on board, the language barrier disappears. And also, it must be a great thing as a psychotherapist to be able to identify issues which housing, childcare, job, whatever it would be, the benefit system, must help you to be able to go, well, actually, if we could if we could get all these things lined up and supportive, that actually I imagine that makes your job as a psychotherapist a lot easier because then that support network can come around an individual and they don't feel like they're isolated, alone and without a voice because you've not only given them the voice, but you've also su surrounded them with the people who need to be there. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it, it, you know, as, as a uh, psychotherapist in, in private practice, I, I have my own uh, private practice as well. Uh, you come into people's lives in a, in a you know, very small uh, cross section. You can be a part of their support network, but you're not in charge of that uh, of that team most of the time. But as you said, uh, Nafsia will provide, I think, or is 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 mindful of uh, the level of support that that person is receiving or has has access to, or has information about uh, uh, that support. Uh, I think traditionally. Uh, GPs in this country do a great job uh, of doing that, of, of really speaking to their patients to really understand if they're getting the right support. And uh, I think uh, they're also mindful of the existence of, of Nasiat uh, in the encatchment area. Say, ah, okay, uh, what would really help this person, in addition to the medical help I'm providing them, to go and see somebody in their own language uh, and get and get help. There, there must be GPs across the country if they heard that were going, I wish, I wish we had that. <laughs> there must be GPs going, this is a Nafsiat thing. I, I understand. We, you know what? We know just the right people. We Let's let's put you on to, uh, to Nafsiat. I think that's, I think that's really, really um, interesting. And the change and the difference it must make to, to people's lives must be absolutely huge. Can you, uh, I, I, I won't ask for anyone's name or, or anything like that, but could you maybe give us a sense if you can, Ali, of um, what people say to you at the end of a, you know, a, a six or 12 weeks uh, a series of conversations, maybe about the difference that having the conversations and to, you know, organize, uh, get it, get involved in an organization like Nafsia has actually had on their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's been really, um, again, uh, an amazing experience for me to, to witness uh, some of the, the changes or some of the, the ending conversations I've had with, with clients. You know, a lot of people might think, okay, six or 12 sessions is not, is not much. You know, what can you really achieve? Uh, but when you think about, again, um, I, I think this is a, an accurate um, description of some of my clients. Some of them uh, don't leave their flats. Again, don't speak English. Uh, you know, they have rarely left their flats in, uh, you know, um, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, and if you then think about some of the cultural issues, speaking to 
uh, if, if you're a woman from uh, like a Turkish or Middle Eastern uh, background, for example, uh, speaking to a man uh, that, that is not in your family uh, in a, in a uh, you know, therapeutic setting, it's uh, hugely different. It's, it's, a, it's a very different experience. And to have the privilege uh, to, to be able to do that with somebody, it's, it's amazing. And at the end of uh, the 12 weeks, I think most of the time, uh, the real interesting uh, feedback I get is uh, that they haven't really experienced something like this in their lives, or that they, uh, you know, their eyes have been open to what's available, or you know, what they can talk about, uh, what kind of relationships they can have, uh, and and really, uh, they they I think. Um, they come away thinking, okay, this is something new that I've experienced uh, and it's been, it's changed. And does that give them the ability to uh, change the way they interact with the world? You know, if, if they've not been able to leave a house or they've not felt comfortable engaging or accessing services, do you get a sense that actually maybe after an, uh, a, a series of, uh, of sessions with an organization like yours, that they, they are able to do that, go and find fulfilling things to do? in life? I, I really hope they do. Uh, I don't, um, you know, uh, usually not in their lives after they're, they're done with uh, their therapy at NAFS yet, but uh, it's very interesting that um, some of them, a lot of them do come back. Uh, a lot of clients do come back. There is a period, you know, cooling off period, I think. Uh, you have to wait a, a few months and then you can re-refer yourself for another, uh, say, 12 sessions. And it's, um, it, it's been really amazing to see uh, clients coming back and to see uh, the change uh, over time, you know, in someone I could have uh, seen two years ago to see them again. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not with clients in the real world, but to really witness even the desire to come back, even the, uh, the, the openness uh, to come back to therapy. I think is is a testament to the success of, of Nafsia. And how do you notice that difference? Is it the way they smile, the way they dress, the way they stand, the way they sit? What 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 is it that you notice? Um, it's 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 not very huge and it's not very overt, <laughs> but the very fact that they're walking through the door uh, is is uh, noticeable. I think. Um, yeah, I don't I don't I don't think people. Um, I mean, clients that now say, or, or psychotherapy clients in general, they don't, they don't really come into the therapy room doing pirouettes. But uh, you know, the, the very fact that that somebody is is willing to come to therapy to open up to explore uh, their inner world, I think that's that's uh, that's the, the clue, the sign. No, I think so, and I think as well a sign that when people do engage with therapy services. They actually think, even if they don't need it for an, an emergency situation anymore, that actually that they found the overall process to be a, a positive one. And it, if the offer is there to continue with that and to, to further explore, that people will take that opportunity, which says to me, Ali, that when people explore their own well-being, when people explore their own minds and some of the issues maybe that they've been carrying with them, that it can become... Um, but therapeutic, but also beneficial in the long run, that people think, well, it's 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 worth not just tackling, you know, a, a past trauma or something I've dealt with, but actually to have an ongoing conversation with my own mind about how I'm feeling, how I'm getting on, how I view myself in five or 10 years time. And that gives me a sense that that's very much the case with, with everyone, um, no matter Absolutely. where they're from. And, and I think people don't realize that um, therapy takes a level of practice, uh, you know, finding uh, the language to express yourself, your emotions, uh, you know, uh, doing a level of self-discovery. You, you don't get that in the first session. You, you need uh, practice. You need time to, um, you know, to experience those emotions. So I guess you, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, anyone who comes in uh, over a long period of time, the change, the, the most noticeable changes in the language, uh, the, the language and the ease in which they express themselves. Absolutely. I'm going to point people in the direction of the uh, the website. Uh, nafsiat.org.uk uh, is the website. Nafsiat.org.uk. I'll also put a link there uh, at the bottom of the podcast so people can click directly on the link, find out more about the work that they uh, do and the uh, the intercultural 
Therapy Center. Uh, Ali Donna, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks for joining us uh, on the podcast and uh, brilliant work that you do in, in 24 different languages, you and the team. And thanks for joining us on Mental Health Monday. Thank you very much for having me on. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this week's podcast. Thanks for checking out Mental Health Monday. My name is Mick Coyle. You can find me on Twitter at Mr. Mick Coyle. You can also find me, Mick Coyle, on Facebook as well. Don't forget, if you want to speak to somebody about your mental health, you can do so. The Samaritans, uh, free to call on 116 123. You can find mental health services where you are. Just look for the Hub of Hope. Type in your postcode. It'll find those mental health services close to you. And for support in a crisis, you can text SHOUT to 85258. That's if you're experiencing a personal crisis, uh, you're unable to cope and need support. Uh, Shout to 85258. That's a text line. Do get involved in those services. In an absolute emergency, always remember the number to call is 999. Thanks for downloading the podcast this week. We'll be back next week with more Mental Health Monday.